this celebration of Christ's resurrection. Um, a couple of announcements before we do get started. Just be sure to check out, there's a number of inserts in your bulletin this morning, uh, upcoming dates, times, that sort of thing, events that are happening here in First St. Paul's. In addition to that, um, today's service is a communion worship, so if you believe, as you come forward, if you believe that the bread and wine that you receive here on the altar is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that it has been given for uh, the forgiveness of your sins, for your eternal life, and for the changing of your life here on earth, then please feel free to come forward, um, and we'll be serving our communion by intention. So as you receive the bread, please uh, dip it in the wine or the grape juice, and the ushers will kind of direct you where to go and, and when to do things. But uh, <coughs> welcome in the name of the Lord. And... Um, Aside from that, I have no other announcements. So as we do begin our worship, I would invite you all to stand. And on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning, I say, the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please share your peace with your neighbors this morning. Good morning.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The stone which the builders rejected has, has become the chief cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. <clears throat> o God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to our sin that we may live with him forever in the joy of the rising again through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he, the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead, all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here is the first reading. The second reading is found on page 915 in your pew Bibles. It is from the sixth chapter of Romans, beginning with the third verse. Do you not know all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized by his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like him, his, we will surely be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now early on the first day of the week, while it was still night, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. 
But Mary remained, and she stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and there she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She answered, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Now supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where they have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced this to the disciples, saying, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'd invite you to remain standing as we sing our next hymn, number 382. <laughs>
just sit right here. Right, sit right here. Around him. Right there. Oh, look at how nice they look. Oh, look at this. Sit right here. Come on up. My goodness. Can we all sit? If we can sit right here, too. Right? Can we have, oh, come up. What a beautiful Ready? 
kids to do is I want you to stand up. And I want you to look out there to the congregation, and I want you to say to your parents, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your friends, whatever, I want you to tell them who has risen on the count of three. You're going to shout it out loud and say, Jesus is risen. We're going to say that as our ending prayer, okay? And I want it loud, and I want them to get excited, okay? Yeah, we'll do that again someday, huh? <laughs> okay? On the count of three, Jesus is risen, right? One, two, three, go! Jesus Have a happy, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Hey, Becky. It's one more graphic children's. <laughs> Today in church, oh, I'm gonna kill me a chicken. <laughs> oh, good stuff. <laughs> well, uh, as we learned, Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Uh, hallelujah. Well, from an earthly, human point of view, that first Easter seems like a day of confusion. But I think from God's point of view, everything went according to plan. See, in the Bible, we have four accounts of Easter, one from each of the Gospel writers. There's a lot of pastors and scholars that complain that it's hard, you know, it's, it's difficult or almost impossible to harmonize these four accounts of the first Easter. Because some people come to the tomb and they see one angel, others show up, they see two, and we read that the women have these servants, and sometimes they're named and sometimes they're not. And in our gospel for today, Mary met Jesus himself at the tomb. And that had to be confusing. It's confusion at Jesus' tomb. But then again, what should we expect when people show up to care for a dead body only to find out that it's not there? We should expect confusion. But like I said, what seems to be confusion to our mind is actually God's finely tuned plan at work. As we look through the Bible, we see evidence of God's perfect timing again and again. And one of the gifts of the 21st century is that we can search through the events of history and we can see God at work in the world. We can look back into history and we can see his patterns. But most of the time, the people who lived through that history, didn't have the opportunity to see the bigger picture. Seemed like confusion to them when, in fact, it was God's plan at work. So from the point of view of the people involved, Easter was a confusing day. But that confusion actually began not on Sunday, but Thursday. Those who had followed Jesus were unable to deal with these constant predictions that he made about his suffering, and his death, and his resurrection. They didn't want to believe that. Jesus couldn't suffer and die. No. These people believed that Jesus was sent to be their savior. And more than that, he had become their friend. He was their teacher. So they couldn't 
and they didn't want to wrap their minds around the idea that his death was the very way that he was going to save them. So when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus on Thursday evening, they couldn't see the plan. It all looked like confusion to them. In fact, it was God's plan at work. Now this state of confusion <clears throat> deepened as Jesus was hung up on the cross. Questions began to run through their mind, like how could this happen? Because if Jesus was supposed to be the Savior, if he was supposed to be God's Messiah, how could he save them now? How could Jesus save them when he was bleeding out on the cross? The people could only see confusion. They couldn't see God's plan. They couldn't see that Jesus was hanging on that cross because he was the Savior. They couldn't see that by him dying on the cross, he was earning forgiveness for the sins of the world. And that is what God had sent the Savior to do. But his followers couldn't understand that just yet. They could only see the confusion. And then there was the timing of his death. Because it was relatively late in the day when Jesus died. And by the time Jesus' followers could get an audience with the governor to get permission to take his body down off from the cross, the Sabbath was almost upon them. And when the Sabbath came, there couldn't be any work for the Jewish people, even the work of burying a body in a tomb. And so there was this confusion of a hasty burial. They rushed to find a tomb nearby. They did the best they could before the sun could set. And they hurried, thinking that they'd come back and finish the burial when the Sabbath was over. Now the confusion of that hasty burial guaranteed that a lot of people would be coming and going from the tomb once the Sabbath was over. Now these people thought that they were going to be finishing Jesus' body, preparing it for the grave. But instead they ended up becoming witnesses of his empty tomb. Now as we look back on these events, we can see that this apparent confusion of the hasty burial was actually God's plan to provide witnesses for Jesus' return from the dead. But all they could see was the confusion. Now all four gospel accounts tell us that Mary Magdalene was among the first to arrive at the tomb. And some of the accounts tell us that she had some friends with her. Um, John, in our gospel text for this morning, focuses on Mary's solo experience. So as we follow Mary that first Easter, we see some very natural reactions to a very supernatural sort of event. Mary arrived at the tomb while it was still night. But it wasn't very dark. We find out elsewhere that this was actually the day of a full moon, so Mary could probably see fairly well, even before sunrise. But what she did see was not what she had expected. Upon her arrival, she saw that the stone no longer covered the entrance of the tomb. And then there was no body questions began to race through her mind. Had someone stolen Jesus' body? Well, maybe the owner of the tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, had already gathered a group of people to move the body to the better place like they had talked about. Well, who knew? But the last thing Mary expected 
in her confusion was that Jesus had risen from the dead. And since Mary didn't even consider the possibility that Jesus was alive again, she did a very natural thing. She looked for help. She went and she found Peter and another disciple, two of Jesus' closest friends, and she told them the news. Peter and this other disciple ran to the tomb, and looking around, they noticed something that added to the confusion. The body was gone, yeah. But then they saw that the burial clothes had been left behind. They had been folded up in a pile. Now, who in their right mind moves a dead body but leaves the clothes behind? Specifically, you would have to undress the body that had already started to decompose. And that just doesn't make any sense. So from a human point of view, things kept getting more and more confusing. Now, of course, from God's point of view, things are still proceeding according to plan. The clothes are there without the body because Jesus came back to life. It makes perfect sense that he would leave these behind because like we would picture with a mummy, these grave clothes kind of wrapped the person up so that they couldn't get around. Um, you know, that people can't get around. But Jesus coming back to life would have had some trouble if he would have left these grave clothes on. So he didn't need them anymore. Jesus simply took them off and left them behind when he rose. Now those folded clothes meant something to this other disciple. He saw them, and in a moment, he realized all the times that Jesus had told his followers that he was going to die. But then he remembered that Jesus had also said that he was going to rise again after three days. And in that moment, things just clicked. The confusion left. And as our reading for this morning says, that disciples saw and believed. And even if Peter didn't quite believe yet, both Peter and this other disciple realized that they couldn't do anything at this empty tomb. And so they returned home in wonder. Now Mary had come back with the disciples to the tomb. And after they left, she decided to take one last look around the empty space. And even more confusion for her, because now when she looked, there were these two angels. And she saw them through tear-filled eyes. They asked her why she was crying, and she told them that she didn't know where her Lord was. She turned to leave, and there was Jesus, but for some reason, maybe the tears in her eyes, she didn't recognize him. But then he called her name. And at that moment, Mary collapsed in joy. She knew what had happened. And the accounts of the other Gospels tell us that she fell to the ground and she grabbed a hold of Jesus' feet. Now Mary had also brought some friends back with her when she came with Peter and the disciple. And in Matthew, we read that they also came and took a hold of Jesus' feet, and they worshipped him. And after Jesus told Mary and the other women to share their joy, he said, go and find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And in that instant, the confusion was gone for these women. They understood that Jesus has risen and that he would be alive forever. Today we're here to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. 
is rising again from the dead. And this resurrection also frees us from confusion. Because we're all born into that confusion that we call sin. And because of this, because we sin and we take part in that reality, Scripture says that we also deserve to spend an eternity that way. An eternity of confusion. Basically, the Bible tells us that that is what hell is. It's an eternity of confusion without God. But the resurrection means that the work Jesus Christ did for you on the cross is valid. Because before Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And his rising again from the dead makes that a statement of triumph. Because when he achieved these things, he became your Savior. And your salvation, you being saved from sin and hell, is finished in the risen Lord. God's promise to you for eternal life in Him is sure and certain. Now, if Jesus had not risen, then suffering and death of God on the cross would be meaningless. We'd all still be lost in our sin. The confusion of sin would reign. And all we'd have to look forward to is that eternity of confusion without him. But Christ has risen. Your salvation <coughs> is sure. You are children of God's kingdom. So your eternity is with Christ. And when the end of this age comes, God has also promised to remove the reality of evil. He's promised to make a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth. And upon the dawning of that era, he has promised to raise you, just as Jesus was raised from the dead. He promises to reunite your body with your soul, to clothe you with perfection and immortality, a garment without sin. And on that day, we're all going to share the joy that Mary had as she fell to the ground and grabbed onto the feet of her risen Savior. Together, the cry will go forth that Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I would invite you to stand as we sing that good news this morning with hymn number 619, verses 1 through 4 and 7 through 8.
faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, love from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On this most holy day, let us pray to God for the church, the earth, and all in need, that the whole world may know the resurrection that God promises to give. I will end each petition with Hear Us, O God. Please respond, your mercy is great. O God of life, pour the life of your Son's resurrection into the churches. Make visible the unity we have in you. Show to each denomination the strengths of the others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Give to the lands and the seas the life of your continuing creation. Water the flowers of springtime and nurture the growing crops. Bless all who protect your plants and animals. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Raise up this assembly with the life of your spirit. Reveal in our community the signs of Christ's resurrection. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O God. We praise your life, we bless your mercy, we honor your power. Transform all that is dying with the joy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. And as you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thank you. 
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene, with Peter, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. of me. In the same way also, and after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, drink. This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we do so to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now together I would invite you to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. If those helping with communion would please come forward at this time. Thanks, O God, that you make your home with us, bringing heaven to earth in this holy meal. Fill us with your spirit as we go from here, that we may wipe away tears and tend to those in mourning and pain by your name. That we would seek the healing of nations and bring to earth the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Would you please stand together as we sing our closing hymn, number 855. 